Okay. Well, hello. hello, this is Zane Horowitz and the Oregon Poison Center for the March 25th, 2021 Journal Club. And since it's spring, we thought we'd talk about some plants, mostly the really bad plants. We get a lot of plant calls that don't amount to serious toxicity, but we thought we'd review in a little bit deeper depth uh, some of the ones that cause us uh, some angst. Um, so not all of these are that common, but we'll t start out and talk about one that actually is this time of year and seems to be a, an Oregon local plant, although it grows quite frequently in many places. So uh, advance the slide. So the first story is one of our favorite sort of around the campfire stories, both literally and uh, figuratively. Uh, we're told a story about the Owahi River in far eastern Oregon, and this plant pictured here, both its stem and its root. Uh, this is an article called Seizures and Death on a White River Flow Trip, a report of water hemlock poisoning. It was written way back in 1985 in the now uh, defunct Western Journal of Medicine. And at that time, they noticed that maybe as many as 8,000 people take this float trip down the Oahe River. Um, and there's been a lot of sort of at that time return to nature kind of things. But this sort of details um, that eight people went on this float trip in April. So this time of year, it's not too long, in 1984. Um, and two of them got quite ill. The first case they talk about is a 27 year old man ultimately got admitted by airlifting to St. Alphonsus Hospital in Boise. You can see where Boise is on that little map up there. He had ingested a large rhizome of water hemlock, which is Secuta vegans. He had a seizure activity, which was generalized tonic-clonic about 45 minutes after he ate it. The seizure lasted about two minutes and then recurred five times, each one lasting about three to five minutes in the next hour or so. He developed partial airway obstruction, became cyanotic, bradycardic, decreased pulse pressure. And although he didn't suffer respiratory arrest at that time, after the last seizure, he became so unresponsive that he was unarousable and a helicopter had to be called to rescue him from the river where they were on a float trip to fly him to Boise, where he was on arrival arousable and oriented, had a good blood pressure, 172 over 92, heart rate of 80. Um, skin was clear, no cyanosis. Um, back then they lavaged his stomach. Uh, they gave him 60 grams of activated charcoal and they watched him for a while. He had no seizures. Um, his glucose was actually 199. Um, they actually did an EEG the, the next day, which was basically normal. Um, it was observed and uh, except for some amnesia for really what happened out there on the river float trip, he was discharged a few days later with what they said his mind was a little fuzzy, what I think we would call brain fog nowadays. Uh, the second individual on the trip was 22 year old. He ate two large rhizomes. About an hour after eating those, he had seizure activity with generalized tonic clonic seizures. Um, had six of those in the next couple of hours and he suffered a cardiac pulmonary arrest and died, um, I believe, out at the Riverside. So he was quite sick. Um, so this all revolves around water hemlock, as you see in the picture there. It's got this nice umbral looking uh, flower at the end of those sort of short white little stemmed each flowers, uh, a very characteristic striped purple and hollow um, stem and then these root system that, you know, I think with some imagination, you might think look like little bitty, bitty premature baby carrots. They're certainly not orange, but I guess if you were looking for edible roots, this might be something that could be easily mistaken. Um, water hemlock is also known as cow bane, the bane of cows, um, sometimes wild parsnip or false parsley goes by a variety of names. It is a sucuta toxin. Um, it is found pretty much everywhere, but mostly near water, therefore water hemlock. And it's probably the number one most poisonous plant in North America. 
seems to be confused with a variety of edible um, plants. And the rhizomes can be different sizes at different times of its uh, maturity. And as little as one mouthful, at least the authors contend, can kill an adult. As obviously, this person who took two large rhizomes died, and the person who took one was quite ill and without medical attention, perhaps would have uh, died. I want to distinguish this because there are two hemlocks that we often talk about, the water hemlock, which is far worse, and the poison hemlock this is the one that was used to um, kill Socrates, which is Conian. This one tends to cause more of a paralysis, whereas water hemlock tends to cause seizures. And so these are some of the ones uh, that we have locally that are particularly toxic. And we see both water and poison hemlock this time of year in the spring here in the Pacific Northwest. And I imagine other folks around the country do as well. But that is sort of our scary around the campfire story of the worst that can happen when you go foraging for baby carrots and get water hemlock in its place. I want to move through the next plant we're going to talk about is this one that has a bright yellow flower and is actually a tree with thin needles. So this is the yellow oleander. And for that, we're going to switch to our fellow Courtney to tell us about the article from Clintox on that. Yes, so this article is about the management of yellow oleander poisoning. And as you can see, it's a really beautiful yellow plant um, that is usually used as an ornamental sort of decorative plant, but it's very poisonous and it's common throughout Mexico and Central America, as well as the West Indies and Sri Lanka, which is uh, mostly what we're going to be talking about because this article is uh, out of Clintox from 2009 um, from the University of Colombo in Sri Lanka. So they uh, go through the description of yellow oleander, which is Favicia peruviana, and that the seeds contain a highly toxic cardiac glycoside, which is the Thavitans A, B, and Nerifilin. So the issue with the yellow oleander is that it causes a significant amount of poisonings each year, predominantly in uh, Asia, Southeast Asia. And after ingestion, they can cause brady and tacky dysrhythmias, but the number of seeds ingested and the glycoside concentrations kind of contribute poorly to prognosis and severity. The clinical presentation of this is really similar to digitalis poisoning. So symptoms include abdominal pain and GI distress, but the main life threats are really the cardiac toxicity um, varying from the PVCs, sick sinus, to heart block, AFib flutter, and then sort of your junctional rhythms and biventricular tachy uh, ventricular tachycardia, which is what we think of with digoxin. Um, the arrhythmogenic effects of the oleander are really from direct toxicity to the myocardium, but also through neurally mediated increases in autonomic activity. So the cardiac glycosides bind to the sodium potassium pump in the cardiac plasma membrane, and that leads to the decrease in uptake of potassium and a rise in intracellular sodium. All of that causes intracellular calcium to increase because there's decreased efflux. Um, and that essentially just results in fluctuations of the membrane potential. So there's increased sympo, uh, sympathomimetic activity, a lot of other mediators, histamine, nitric oxide, leukotrienes. So they can be very toxic. Um, they do just briefly mention that there are a few differences between yellow oleander and uh, digoxin poisoning. So the yellow oleander toxicities usually are found in younger patients uh, without pre-existing conditions. And that's as opposed to a digoxin toxicity for which we're usually medicating someone with multiple comorbidities. Um, it's not necessarily an overdose, whereas with the yellow oleander that we're typically seeing a purposeful ingestion. Um, and then secondary heart block is more commonly seen in the oleander while AFib and flutter are less common, but we do see those more often with digoxin toxicity. Uh, and then the last sort of difference is there are electrolyte abnormalities. Uh, so hypokalemia, uh, hypomagnesemia are more common in digoxin uh, toxicity, probably because of concomitant use of diuretics typically. Um, but both of those seem to be unaltered in oleander poisonings. So their goal with this article was to take a look back and just to see what the general management uh, suggested in the literature is for these poisonings. So this is a literature review of 53 articles 
Um, and then it begins to sort of go through and uh, piece together what's currently currently being done and then if there's any other recommendations to current treatment. So initial assessment of these poisonings is, of course, the ABCs. Uh, urgent EKG with any fluid resuscitation because these patients will typically have a lot of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. So any fluid losses um, are vital to for evaluation pretty urgently. And then a continuous EKG for at least 24 hours is recommended. And that's based off of one study which cited a number of patients that developed a sudden cardiac arrest while having had normal conduction for two to three days, actually. Uh, the clinical picture of the patient, though, is really emphasized. So if the patient is completely asymptomatic, hemodynamically unstable, um, no GI symptoms, normal EKG, normal lights, uh, the general management is that patient is most likely safe for discharge after a 24-hour observation period. Um, for patients who do have symptoms, uh, ranging from just GI, vomiting, diarrhea, to shock, uh, electrolytes are to be checked every six hours, potassium in particular, because hypokalemia can worsen this toxicity. Uh, and some literature has suggested treatment with potassium, even in the presence of a normal potassium concentration, if there are any presence of arrhythmias. The other side of that is hyperkalemia then becomes a marker of toxicity that's associated with more poor outcomes. So that also needs to be corrected. Um, and they suggest using insulin to drive potassium into cells, um, which will reduce the pharmacologic effects of the dandridge toxin. Um, k exalate of course, for potassium correction is also suggested in these situations, but remembering that this is an extracellular shift and not necessarily an increase in the total body potassium, um, they, they'll just have us keep in mind that this could precipitate hypokalemia, especially if you're giving this with DigFab. In terms of the magnesium, we just mentioned a couple of minutes ago that that's a difference between yellow oleander and digoxin. So uh, the yellow oleander poisoning seem to have both high and low magnesiums, um, but in general, they seem to be unchanged. But if they are hypomag, that can worsen the cardiac uh, glycoside toxicity, but there's not a lot of data for this particular ingestion. Uh, in terms of calcium, IV calcium is controversial. Um, it's still controversial in the literature, it seems, uh, especially with this in the Sri Lankan literature. So intracellular calcium is really high with ditch toxicity, and the dogma is that that may worsen arrhythmias and should be avoided, and that's the basis of the stone heart theory. But uh, as we know, uh, based on our dogma conversation a couple weeks ago, in a porcine model, IV calcium was shown to be safe in administration, but it's really unclear if it's uh, actually effective for the hyperkalemia. So they have not given a firm stance on that. Um, and they just make note that it is still back and forth in the literature. Um, there is no emesis or lavage benefits that have been demonstrated, but particularly in Southeast Asia, these are still used in practice, and a lot of that is because availability of resources, so this seems to be a viable option uh, for larger ingestions. And with that, they um, have quite a few points about activated charcoal. Um, so single dose and multiple dose are up for question among several sources, it looks like in this literature, specific to the yellow oleander. Um, charcoal should reduce the toxicity by preventing absorption soon after ingestion and interrupting the enterohepatic circulation would be the argument for MDAC. Um, but two uh, larger clinical trials have shown conflicting results with that, um, specifically in mortality reduction. One showed a really significant reduction in mortality and one did not. And uh, there are some things at the root of those potentially patient populations, whether one population was sicker or not. And that was um, that would have been the study that did not show a significant reduction in mortality. Um, there is also a 2007 policy uh, at hospitals in Sri Lanka that they will treat patients with MDAC. And that particular center that they are citing saw a 40% reduction in patient transfers for heart locks, but again, no difference in mortality. Um, so it doesn't really seem to be a question if uh, SDAC or MDAC are safe, it's just whether they influence the ultimate outcome. Um, but MDAC is really important in these ingestions uh, resource-wise because of the economic potential. Sri Lankan hospitals have activated charcoal that's free of charge as a public service, and it really only costs about $50 per full treatment protocol per patient. So um, 
So it's a it's a really important thing to consider in the treatment of these patients and something that should remain open as a question in the literature for more data and more trials because uh, obviously it has the potential to reduce the need for higher levels of care and transfer like pacing. Um, and with that, we can talk briefly about arrhythmias. So the Brady dysrhythmias are usually treated with atropine, isoproteranol, salbutamol, and temporary pacing, but there are many areas of the world where yellow oleander poisoning is prevalent and pacing isn't available. So the beta adrenergic agents and the anticholinergic agents are used to try to temporize them um, while they're symptomatic. So they note that treatment with these medications may actually be deleterious. Theoretically, brainy dysrhythmias can result in escape rhythms, escape tachy dysrhythmias, which we're sort of trying to prevent with those. Um, but because the DIG toxin increases the intracellular calcium and the beta adrenergic stimulation increases this, they could actually further the risk, increase the risk of the tachydysrhythmias. Atropine is still used to increase the heart rate and improve nodal conduction, but it's very short lived. So they really don't see any reduction in mortality or need for pacing that really hasn't been determined. But what they do comment on is that it actually may decrease the GI motility such that the impact on absorption might uh, worsen toxicity in certain patients, particularly if larger doses are used. So um, large doses of atropine have also been implicated in some of the sudden deaths in prior studies. So it's suggested to sort of titrate to ma maintain the heart rate between 60 and 90 to avoid tachycardia. Um, and then temporary pacing is recommended for any heart rate below 40 or any heart block. But again, in a resource area, this is really difficult, requires pacing, requires a, additional training that many of the healthcare providers there don't have. Um, for the tachy dysrhythmias, these are more dangerous, uh, much more difficult to treat. There aren't really um, a lot of studies in the yellow oleander on the antiarrhythmics. All the data is really from digitalis toxicity. So um, that's extrapolated and VTAC is then best treated with Lido. Um, amio, quinidine, calcium channel blockers are contraindicated, according to the authors, because they may increase the DIG concentration. And of course, beta blockers may worsen a heart block from a nodal standpoint. VTAC may be resistant to cardioversion uh, and may promote BFib. The AFib here is usually slower um, and, and not with a rapid uh, ventricular response. IV mag, interestingly, uh, they've uh, proposed be used, especially with digoxin poisoning, even in the presence of an elevated serum mag. Remember, the magnesium is uh, findings are different between yellow oleander poisoning and ditch poisoning um, because magnesium is needed to function the sodium potassium pump appropriately. But there is a study in Sri Lanka that patients treated with IV mag for yellow oleander poisoning, a, a bolus plus infusion. Uh, that center saw an alarming increase in deaths, so they actually abandoned this and recommend against it in oleander poisoning. Uh, but again, that's from one study. Um, DIGFAB is uh, probably the most interesting part of this treatment protocol. Um, randomized controls trials have found this to be effective in reversing the life-threatening arrhythmias and correcting the hyperkalemia. It's not available any longer in Sri Lanka. They did have it for a little while, but it's very expensive and very hard for them to get. Um, and in, in the prior cases that where they've had it and it's been given, they've given 1,200 milligrams regardless of the patient's weight, age, sex. Um, and they found it effective, though the dose is obviously significantly higher than we would give in ditch poisoning. So the cost per life saved with the DIG fab was about $10,000. And again, that's versus 50 US dollars for an entire treatment of MDAC. Um, so something to think about in terms of resource availability. Um, and the, the real risk for DIG fab otherwise, other than cost would be allergic reactions and bronchospasm. Um, and then the, the final thing is just about elimination. There, Hemodialysis is not used because of the large volume of distribution, but um, that's again in digoxin and hasn't been studied uh, in the yellow oleander. So um, in summary, this paper sort of tried to collect a lot of the uh, current recommendations for yellow oleander management. But a lot of the data that we are trying to use in order to treat these patients comes from um, more heavily studied digoxin data. And what we have are a couple different studies that are either suggesting that 
Um, yellow oleander is very different from digoxin, um, such as with the magnesium, or we can't really be sure about what to actually suggest uh, in terms of the SDAC or MDAC, but generally it seems to be safe and cost effective and may help temporize some of the absorption. So it seems that we should go ahead and give that. It seems that we should go ahead and give DigFab if we have it. That seems to work as well in the studies that they do have. And then otherwise treat uh, any cardiac dysrhythmias and hemodynamic instability as we would with uh, any type of Dig type toxin poisoning. Yeah, yeah. this is um, probably one of the ones that are a little bit worse than Dig because it's, it's acute. Um, the good news is it tends to happen in young people who do this as a suicidal gesture and may start out healthier than the chronic Dig patient. Um, despite it mostly growing in South Asia, um, the last year we had good statistics, which is 2019, there were five total plant-related fatalities in the NPTS database, and two of those five were due to yellow and oleander. The specific details, I don't know, but I would imagine it was a possible suicides. Um, it grows mostly in three states, Texas, Florida, and Hawaii. But, you know, with uh, the internet and people willing to buy things, the seeds or things, it's, it could show up anywhere. But one of our really bad plants, I would say amongst the cardiac glycosides, it's the second worst cardiac glycoside. I want to turn to one that is far worse uh, than that, or at least its name suggests it. Um, and Obert's our rotating emergency medicine resident is going to tell us about two very closely related plants with really big seeds, uh, the pong pong tree and the sea mango, both in the genus Cerbera. Cerberus was, of course, the dog that guarded the gates of hell. So, Ober, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. So, I'll start off by talking about this article published in 2020 um, about the suicide tree. Um, also known as the pong pong tree, that um, the plant itself is the Cerbera odella, and it is indigenous to India and Southeast Asia. The plant has very highly cardiotoxic seeds um, that contain a toxin known as Cerberin, and it's used um, for like suicide, homicide, and the way the toxin works is it disrupts the cardiac electrical activity um, and can cause hyperkalemia. It inhibits the sodium potassium ATPase exchanger in the myocardial cells, um, similar to digoxin. Partly, the plant itself is available for sale online through the World Wide Web um, and through multiple tropical plant retailers, so people are able to acquire this plant here in the United States. The article talked about um, one case that they had. It was a 32-year-old transgender female. She has a past medical history of depression and suicidal ideation. She presented to the hospital with nausea, lethargy, and one episode of non-bloody emesis. Purportedly, she was on the internet and found the Cerbera odalum plant and she ingested one seed of the plant um, in an attempt to end her life. The exact time between ingestion and the presentation to the hospital was unknown, but when the EMS arrived to her house, they found that she had a heart rate of 30 and she had an ECG showing junctional rhythm. So on presentation to the emergency department and hospital, um, she, was denying any further symptoms of headaches, chest pain, palpitation, shortness of breath, abdominal symptoms. Um, and she was also given 10 vials of Digibind. Um, her vital signs, she had a blood pressure of 105 on 74, tachycardic at 106 beats per minute, respiratory rate of 18, 98.6, her temperature 98% on room air, and the remainder of her physical examination was normal. In terms of the investigations that were obtained, she had positive cannabis. Her digoxin level was 0.2 nanograms per meal, negative salicylate Tylenol level, um, 
and her blood alcohol level was zero, lactate of 1.2. Her CBC was um, unremarkable. And um, in terms of her electrolytes, her sodium was 138 with a potassium of 4.3, and her bicarb was 29. She had normal renal function, um, and her liver enzymes were largely unremarkable. An ECG was obtained, and her heart rate was 36, noted to be sinus urticardic. Her PR interval was 136, with a QRS of 82, and QTC interval of 323 without ischemic changes. So over the course of her hospital stay, um, she had one episode of hypoglycemia um, with a glucose of 60. So she was given IV dextrose and she didn't require any further digoxin because her potassium was normal and her EKG improved to normal sinus rhythm on the second day of admission. And she also got a psychiatric consult for um, her suicidal ideation. And then she was medically cleared on um, the third day of admission and transferred to inpatient psychiatry. So some of the interesting points um, noted in this article. So the cerebrum cardiotoxin um, is found in the seed of the C. odolum tree. And it grows along the seashores, river, and salt swamps in South India, Southeast Asia, Madagascar, and Australia. And the tree itself, the plant itself, has also come to the Hawaiian Islands. And so um, it can be found in the United States as well. And also recently, you can also acquire that through the internet. There are very similar plants to the C. odolum tree, which is the Cerebra mancus or the C. manca, which I'll talk about later. And some of the distinguishing um, features is the C. odolum tree has um, usually like a yellow center, um, and then the C. mancus has a pink center. <clears throat> so the cerebrin toxin has a similar mechanism of action as the joxin, um, and some of the symptoms and signs associated with odolum toxicity are like headaches, muscle weakness, dizziness, altered mental status, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, chest pain, bradycardia, um, hyperkalemia, thrombocytopenia, and on ECG can cause a variety of different um, arrhythmias, particularly um, junctional rhythms, um, nod nodal arrhythmias, heart blocks, all of the heart blocks. And death is purportedly very painful from this toxin. The cerebrum mechanism of action, it inhibits the sodium potassium ATPase exchanger in the cardiac cells, and it can result in increased extracellular potassium and increased intracellular sodium. And this can disrupt the electrochemical gradient of the, um, the sodium calcium exchanger and can cause a buildup of calcium within the cell, in the myocardial cell, and that can lengthen the cardiac action potential, thereby reducing the heart rate. The buildup of the calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum can also lead to increased inotropy, and the increased extracellular potassium can lead to hyperkalemia, weakness, arrhythmias. And in the article, they noted um, that with the, the lethal dose of um, the odolum seed is about like half a seed. And in terms of recommendations for treatment associated um, with odolum toxicity, so number one would be supportive. Um, patients can have bradycardia and um, that can be treated with atropine as well as pacemaker therapy. Um, digoxin, and number two, digoxin immune fab um, has mixed results, and this is postulated because of lower affinity of digoxin um, for the specific antibody fragments for the C. odolum toxins. Um, and number three would be uh, managing the hyperkalemia with potassium lowering agents. And then the second article that I looked at um, is about cerebra mancus fruit which can cause carbenolide poisoning. 
And this article was released in 2008 um, from Eastern Sri Lanka. So the Cerebra mangus um, plant is a small tree of the Apocynaceae family, and it is very commonly found along the coasts of South Asia and Southeast Asia, Northern Australia, and Polynesia. The latex that is present throughout the plant itself contains cardenolites such as cerberin, uh, neurofolin, and cerebroside. And the toxins itself can inhibit the sodium potassium ATPase pump as well and can result in vomiting, cardiac dysrhythmias, and hyperkalemia, which is very similar to the odalin plant. The article presents a case related to a 30-year-old male who ingested um, Natchukai seeds for the family. And on presentation to the hospital, he was very drowsy. He had an AVPU score of pain, arousable to pain only. And he was bradycardic into the 40s with a blood pressure of 100 over 60. And when he arrived to this hospital, they gave him atropine, bolus, and infusions to a total of 15 milligrams. And that improved his heart rate to 74 and his blood pressure to 120, 150. They also performed gastric lavage um, in case there were residual seeds. They believed that he had ingested the seeds about four hours prior to arrival and did the gastric lavage. Across the um, ED course, he became suddenly quite bradycardic and they admitted him to ICU and started isoprenaline drip. He then subsequently developed um, third degree heart block and went into ventricular fibrillation arrest and died. Um, there were no blood samples sent um, due to low resource area unable to perform any labs for several hours. And the family um, later brought in the Natch Kukai fruit plant, and it was confirmed to be consistent with the C. mingus fruit plant. The article talks about um, C. mingus and talks about it being um, a very common cause of plant poisonings in the Sri Lankan area. Um, it also speaks to a case fatality rate of 20 to 28 percent. So the diagnosis of C. mangus poisoning is, and cardenolide poisoning is primarily based off of um, clinical suspicion if the person has been eating these seeds um, and also the constellation of signs and symptoms to include vomiting, cardiac dysrhythmias. And the treatment for um, cerebral mangus poisoning include number one, gastric lavage, um, number two, atropine isoprenaline um, to counteract the bradycardia, and number three would be hyperkalemic standard treatments, and number four, um, digi talk, uh, digoxin fab, if that is available. Thank you. Yeah, no, both of uh, these, although mostly in Sri Lanka and India, South Asia, people have been buying these on the internet. There's one article suggested, and there's been an increasing number of poisonings with these, and you probably only need a seed or less. And now these seeds are quite big. You can see there in the drawing, um, but they are um, enough for just buying one of these seeds if you eat them to be fatal. So. By that, it might be in my book, please make this one of the more toxic uh, cardiac glycosides that are out there and one we should be uh, aware of. And, and we treat both of these the same way we treat digoxin toxicity. And even though they said you may not be able to tell uh, uh, if it's in the blood by a digoxin level, at least in the first case report, they found some concentrations of digoxin on the patient who was not taking digoxin otherwise. So those are other cardiac glycosides to watch out for. One small footnote in the first article, which I found fascinating, is that um, certain coconut crabs in the South Pacific who eat predominantly this as their diet, the pong pong tree seeds, when eaten by humans at the top of the food chain, 
the humans can get quite ill. Apparently, the coconut crabs don't have too much of a problem with this. So, two cardiac glycosides. Let's change direction a little bit to some other really toxic plants. Let's talk about this uh, nice purple flowery plant, which is monk's hood or aconitum. And for that, we have uh, John, our fellow. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. I'm muted. All right, um, so I'll be talking about aconitine poisoning. Um, and I did a review by uh, Thomas Chan um, out of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, and so this is aconitine and other aconitum alkaloids, which are highly cardiotoxic and neurotoxic um, toxins found in all parts of the plants of aconitum species. Um, like the picture there, um, the toxins or the alkaloids are most abundant in the roots and root tubers, but they are throughout the entire plant. Um, in Europe and North America, aconite toxicity usually occurs after ingestion of a wild plant, uh, but in Asia, it's more common um, in prepared products such as tinctures or capsules, um, as it's used in traditional medicine for multiple uses. Um, in this paper, um, including analgesics, cardiotonics, anti-inflammatories, uh, antipyretics, aphrodisiacs, morphacents, treatment of cough, asthma, snake bite, vomiting, and diarrhea. So really used for pretty much anything um, by both homeopathic and traditional medicine practitioners, leading to a higher incidence of poisoning in those areas. Um, the active ingredients uh, that we're worried about are the C19 diterpenoid alkaloids, uh, which include aconitine, mesoconitine, and hypoconitine. Um, they all do have some varying variance in their degree of toxicity. Um, mesoconitine is similar to aconitine. Um, and there are other aconitine alkaloids that may be present based on the specific plant that is used. Um, and these again vary toxicity. Um, because some of them are less toxic compared to aconitine as others. Um, for example, the cardiotoxicity of lap aconitine is much lower, um, and it's present in a plant would lower the risk of cardiac toxicity. Um, a couple other interesting constituents of the plant, um, uh, the roots themselves also contain um, hygienamine, which is a beta agonist with positive chronotropic and inotropic effects. And Chorinine, a dopamine derivative, which has positive alpha adrenergic effects. Um, and as I've kind of alluded to so far, the, the, the most toxic part uh, is the roots and the roots tubers, followed by flowers and leaves and stems. Um, and again, as this is a plant, um, the amount of toxin present at any given time would vary based on the species when it was harvested, the surrounding conditions that the plant was grown in, and you know if that plant part that was consumed was processed in any way. Um, typically processing will remove a lot of the alkaloids. Um, so the wild plant is thought to be the uh, most toxic. Um, estimated lethal dose in humans is two milligrams of pure aconitine, five milliliters of an aconitine tincture, one gram of the wild plant. Um, and there are multiple case reports that are cited here throughout um, at varying doses. Um, Speaking a little bit about the mechanism of toxicity of the aconitum alkaloids. Um, the mechanism is primarily, primarily related to the action of aconitine on uh, voltage, voltage sensitive sodium channels of cell membranes of excitable tissues, such as myocardium, nerves, and muscles. Um, they bind with a high affinity to the open state of this voltage, uh, voltage sensitive sodium channel at site two. Um, preventing further activation um, by blocking their causing, excuse me, causing a persistent activation by blocking their inactivation. And this ultimately leads to um, them being refractory to excitation. In the heart, uh, there's a number of rhythmogenic effects that can happen, including ventricular fibrillation, torsades, uh, ventricular tachycardia, and ventricular ectopic beats. And that's a, a big part of the toxicity of aconitine. There are also some anticholinergic effects mediated on the vagus nerve that can lead to arrhythmogenic uh, effects as well. Um, and the, there was a single study that reported 
um, some hypotensive and bradycardic actions, which were mediated through autonomic nervous system disruption, um, notably in the ventral medial nucleus of the hypothalamus. Um, and that can also cause bradycardic actions as well. We, so, so we see tachycardia, you can also see bradycardia in these cases. Um, looking at the toxokinetics of the plant, metabolism is primarily by these carboxyesterases that are um, present um, in multiple uh, cells in the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and these are then these are conitine toxins, so conitine, metaconitine, hypoconitine, are all then hydrolyzed um, to their respective free acids and then hydrolyzed again to their inert compounds. Um, there is uh, some multiple cases they go over kind of looking at toxicokinetics and what I'll just say just from all of these cases, there's some conflicting data. Um, and I think this also speaks to, you know, the different concoctions that were consumed and amounts. Um, but there was uh, lag time and half-life time and elimination, all which varied to, and it's varied based on the composition from these case reports. And when I talk about conflicting data, there's one case report where they suggested that the uh, majority of elimination occurred via um, feces, um, whereas, uh, and urine, whereas the other, another study says that the renal pathway appears to be the most important for elimination. And then um, another thought is that, you know, CYP3A um, is, a predominant metabolizer of this. Um, so overall, I think that with a vari uh, variation in composition, you're gonna have a variation in timeline and half-life of all of these toxins. Looking at the clinical features, um, there was a review of three studies, a total of 52 patients across all studies. And again, there's a, there's a, a, a wide range in the preparation of a content that was consumed. Um, as well as the effects and latent periods. So looking at those studies, the latent range was anywhere from three minutes after consumption to 120 minutes. The majority of effects of um, these cases um, were kind of grouped into different systems and the most common being neurological symptoms, which could include anything from paresthesias to perioral numbness uh, or muscle weakness. And then, um, the next most common was cardiovascular problems. Um, and that may include anything based on the way they group this to chest pain or palpitations or any abnormal heart rate. So the, the, the description of cardiac symptoms was chest pain, palpitations, hypotension, um, sinus tachycardia, bradycardia, and then a list of arrhythmias. Um, they further broke that up and then um, the three different studies looked at ventricular arrhythmias. Um, and one study of 18 patients said 11% had ventricular arrhythmias. Another study of 17 patients had 88.2% of arrhythmias. And then in a study of 17 patients had 23.5% in their study that had ventricular arrhythmias. Two of the studies reported gastrointestinal symptoms as well. So vomiting, um, abdominal pain, diarrhea, um, a study of 17 patients had about half, 52%, and another had 72%. And overall, the mortality was pretty variable across these studies as well. One study of 18 patients, 17 patients had zero deaths. And then the uh, one study um, had 11.8% mortality. And that, just to note, is the same study that also reported 88% of their patients with ventricular arrhythmias. So that definitely seemed to be the sickest study group. Um, looking at um, the main causes of death um, in these cases, um, it appears to be, you know, refractory ventricular arrhythmias and asystole and cardiovascular collapse. Um, and looking at, you know, the majority of patients that die, it seems to be from a poorly processed or unprocessed plant product. Um, there's a little discussion about diagnosis of this, which is mainly clinical and based on the history. Um, there are some studies that have been developed, um, diagnostic tests, but at this time, I don't think any of them are widely clinically available and affordable. Management for this. Um, so there is no, uh, you know, antidote for conitine toxicity. Um, treating any cardiovascular collapse aggressively. Um, 
in this review, there's no mention of discussion of any elimination. Um, but if a patient with a pretty good story came in early on, this would be someone that I think it would be reasonable to consider, uh, you know, intubation and lavage um, if they presented early enough um, to avoid the downstream effects of recurrent ventricular arrhythm arrhythmias and cardiovascular collapse. Treatment of the aconitine induced ventricular arrhythmias uh, is usually refractory to cardioversion and antiarrhythmic drugs, making it very difficult to manage. Uh, there's a study of 15 patients in that study. No single agent uniformly was effective. And on average, patients received two antiarrhythmic agents. Um, across the study, they received between one and four, um, including lidocaine, amiodarone, and bertrillium. Ultimately, based on this small study, it appears that amiodarone may be more effective at cardioversion than lidocaine. Um, and there were two patients that responded to flecainide. So the overall recommendation, um, again, these are small numbers, five and two. Uh, the overall recommendation was use of amiodarone or flecainide for contain induced arrhythmias. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that flecainide also has an increased risk in itself if there is hypokalemia, which may be present and should be corrected if that is the agent that's used. If there is recurrent ventricular arrhythmias and recurrent cardiovascular collapse, the recommendation at that point in this review article is to then consider something to bridge them and to wait until they kind of metabolize everything um, or eliminate everything, and that would be ECMO or a ventricular cyst device. Um, so in summary, contained roots uh, contain a toxic aconitum alkaloids, which are known cardiac and neurotoxin. Um, you get life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias with this, um, and the risk is higher with wild plant um, or inadequately processed roots and or tincture preparations. And management is supportive, um, but can be very difficult with refractory ventricular arrhythmias and shock. Um, so very important to treat aggressively and consider the early use of uh, cardiopulmonary bypass in these patients. Yeah, thanks. Good. Yeah, we uh, aconitine is part of a group of plant toxins that are all sodium channel op openers and they bind to the sodium channel and leave it in the open stage. Aconitine seems to be one of the worst of, of the group. It also causes seizures and some neurotoxic effects. And then very uniquely reported occasionally by ventricular tachycardia with an upward, then a downward, then upward, then downward uh, QRS complex. And again, this is the one where amiodarone is probably the first line to reach for, but would be the first line for most ACLS ventricular arrhythmias. But often that's not enough, and they need multiple different antiarrhythmics and good supportive care uh, to, to kind of treat these folks. So definitely another of our very bad plants to consider. Um, moving forward to yet another plant who has a toxin that works Similarly, in the sodium channel, um, the plant itself isn't eaten very much, but a food source from the plant seems to cause a very fascinating cluster of cases. And to tell us about that, we have our fellow Jen. Yes, so I am going to talk about the review paper um, from ClinTox um, entitled Clinical Review of granotoxin mad honey poisoning, past and present. Um, so mad honey um, poisoning is pretty well described um, in Turkey, uh, particularly in the Eastern Black Sea area of Turkey, though it has also been described um, in Europe and occasionally in the United States. Um, sort of classically um, known with clinical symptoms, including uh, bradycardia, hypotension, respiratory depression, and altered mental status, sort of that's where it's MAD uh, name uh, is derived from. Um, it's actually been described all the way back to 401 BC um, by a uh, Athenian author and military commander, where he describes an episode of MAD honey poisoning that incapacitated his army as they traveled through the Black Sea region of Turkey. Um, and then sort of is later described um, in uh, 67 BC, um, where a Greek physician uh, made a recommendation to a king 
um, to make a tactical retreat and leave mad honey containing honeycombs in the path of uh, Roman troops who then uh, consumed the honey uh, from the honeycombs and the Roman army was uh, incapacitated and overcome by this uh, Greek or this Turkish uh, king. Uh, so sort of uh, interestingly described um, in past historical contexts. Um, it's well documented, like I said, uh, sort of starting in the uh, late 18. Uh, hundreds. Um, there was a case described in 1896 in the United States um, that was a case series of eight cases uh, occurring in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, and then later um, was uh, there was a second case series of 14 patients in New Jersey, again, with um, this sort of honey intoxication. Um, so where does it derive from? So granotoxin um, is a cyclic hydrocarbon um, that's a non-nitrogen containing hydrocarbon, sort of interesting, um, that is derived from the family, I'm not going to pronounce this correctly, but Aracaceae, um, and includes uh, a flower that we're all pretty familiar with of the rhododendron. You know, I have we have one in um, the garden in my house. Um, but in Turkey, there are two rhododendron species that are classically associated with um, like toxic granotoxins um, that are in the flowers. Um, although there are a few plants in the United States um, of the rhododendron species, particularly the Western Azalea, the California Rose Bay, um, the uh, mountain laurel and the sheep laurel um, that are all sources of granotoxin. And there are at least 60 different granotoxins, but the primary um, toxic compounds are granotoxins one and three. Um, and how does this get incorporated into um, honey? So when the bees ingest the nectar from the rhododendron plant that contains granotoxin, it's incorporated into um, the honey that they then produce. Um, there have been a few um, studies looking at the mechanisms of poisoning around uh, granotoxin, um, particularly looking at how um, it induces its respiratory and cardiac effects. Uh, one was done in, I think both have been done in rat models. Um, and one was done uh, where they were given uh, intro cerebroventricularly, so very specifically, um, doses. Um, and they were also given intraperitoneal doses um, in uh, rats. Um, and they saw sort of what uh, bradycardic and um, respiratory depressive effects it had. Um, they similarly did a study where they uh, did a, a bilateral vagotomy. So they cut the vagus nerve in the rats and um, they gave uh, granotoxin and found that the rats did not uh, develop bradycardia. So they thought it was likely mediated by the vagus nerve. Um, and then another study where they gave a selective muscarinic uh, antagonist and administered again granotoxin um, and saw that they did not develop bradycardia, but they still developed respiratory depression. And so thought that maybe the specific, specifically that the M2 muscarinic receptors were involved in the cardiotoxicity component, not necessarily the respiratory component. So as Zane um, sort of mentioned earlier, granotoxin, um, when you look at it at a cellular level, is a sodium uh, channel effector. And what it does is it binds the sodium channel, voltage-dependent sodium channels in an open state and um, prevents them from inactivating and thus uh, hyperpolarizes the cells. You sort of get this um, persistent uh, sodium channel opening. Um, the article then sort of describes the characteristic uh, symptoms and uh, makes a comparison sort of to cholinergic toxicity. I think that's sort of, um, some of, you know, when we're thinking about the um, classic symptoms associated with uh, mad honey poisoning, some of them can um, look similar to cholinergic toxicity, particularly the hypotension and bradycardia. But most of the patients um, actually develop more um, CNS symptoms as well, so altered mental status and dizziness, which are not technically really classically associated with cholinergic poisoning. Um, and they will sometimes get salivation in about 15% of the cases, but things like the lacrimation, urination, diarrhea, bronchorrhea that are 
very classically associated with cholinergic uh, toxicity are not associated with granotoxin poisoning. So sort of where the two um, symptoms don't, or the two syndromes don't overlap. Um, when they looked at the different cardiac dysrhythmias that were uh, produced, um, and again, this is a very small sample of a few case series and case reports, about 75% of the cases had a nonspecific bradyarrhythmia or just a sinus bradycardia. About 25% had different uh, types of heart block. Um, and only one patient, which was uh, one a little bit over 1%, was asystolic. So generally, you can expect a um, sort of sinus bradycardia or some sort of nonspecific bradycardia in these patients. Um, in terms of trying to assess how much honey you need to eat um, to uh, develop these symptoms, um, it is uh, pretty small. So in one report, they estimated it was about 13.45 uh, grams and symptoms started about 30 minutes to three hours after eating the honey. Um, most of the Severe toxicity would be within the first 24 hours, and if uh, patients survived or were asymptomatic after 24 hours, it was unlikely that they would develop um, toxicity from uh, ingesting mad honey. Uh, we treat it with atropine, um, sort of the key uh, to the supportive care in the management of these patients. Um, there is a case of one patient who got a temporary transvenous uh, pacemaker because they developed complete heart block related to it. But uh, for the most part, uh, atropine and uh, saline fluid resuscitation are um, the mainstays of treatment. Um, so one part, the end of the article sort of um, interesting discussion as to why um, mad honey is sort of classically reported in this very specific region of Turkey and why there's fewer reports of it um, in places like North America and in Europe. Um, one uh, component of this is uh, the cultural factor that there are Turkish beekeepers that purposefully harvest man honey um, as an alternative health product um, and distribute it for a variety of ailments that patients uh, have. And so it is sort of has its own market. Um, another is that there are a lot of um, non-commercial honey producers in Turkey. Um, and so individual beekeepers sell their uh, honey products at local markets. And so while commercial honey in Turkey uh, comes from a amalgamation of uh, many, many hives um, and may contain granotoxin. It's sort of diluted out because they're obtaining so much honey from so many different locations. Um, whereas if you have an individual farmer that sort of has the bees localized to a single area, the concentration of um, granotoxin may be uh, a lot higher um, and it's often unprocessed. Um, and so it may be that they're... Um, the regionality is because of these uh, local beekeepers and sales of local products. Um, another uh, hypothesis was that are the plants different? Um, and uh, there are these, like I said, very specific um, or cassia uh, plants that are in the area of Turkey um, and that they sort of are acclimated to the climate of Turkey and the area there um, and that they don't really thrive um, in other places. Um, and then a third component that they question were the bees different, um, but there seems to be no difference between the honeybees uh, in Turkey versus the honeybees in other parts of the world. Um, so it was a interesting review of um, uh, mad honey and um, just taught me a few things about why uh, mad honey is sort of so specific to uh, Turkey and um, why, unfortunately, I probably won't see it as a tox fellow. Well, you never know. They did have that big cluster back in New Jersey at the uh, last century. So, but, and now with the internet, people can buy stuff from all, all over the world as they're apt to do. And, and I looked online from the usual internet sources and there were a bunch of different people selling mad honey from different parts of the world. 
and who knows if it has granotoxin in it or not. On, on a small historical footnote, uh, they talk about, you know, King uh, Mithridates as being the one who had the brilliant idea of poisoning the pursuing Roman ar uh, army. And actually, the Tox History Society uh, journal was called the Mithridates. Um, if anyone has any idea where that came from or is puzzled by that weird name, that's uh, from where it came from. So finally, I want to turn to yet another plant that's not usually eaten, but has sort of worked its way up to be utilized as a pharmaceutical product in, in certain parts of the world and has its own unique uh, toxicity. So to tell us about that, then we will talk about uh, this plant, uh, uh, the iboga plant, or the ibogaine, is our fellow Matt. So I have an article that, that basically is questioning or wondering how toxic is ibogaine. Thank you for pulling up the plant picture. Um, it's not one as as you were saying is very familiar to us, but it's probably going to gain increasing prominence over the next few years, given the um, uh, current pharmaceutical interest in the drug or resurgence of it. Um, this the the ibogaine is a derivative of the root bark primarily of the Tabernanthe iboga plant, which grows in Western and Central Africa in the rainforest regions. It's been used for a long time by indigenous cultures for religious contexts for the um, what would have perceived to be the psychedelic effects of the drug, um, but the Western um, world first discovered it in the early 1900s um, during French exploration of this um, of Western Africa, and uh, used the root extract to create a, a compound called lamborin, which was sold as a stimulant and psychoactive for fatigue and depression until it was made illegal in France in the mid 1900s. Research into the into ibogaine also. Um, found that it had anti-addictive properties and it was first used in opioid dependence and it was found to help with opioid withdrawal. And it was also used broadly for other substance use disorders including alcohol dependence, nicotine addiction, among others, though the opioid um, dependence was its main focus until it was made illegal in, in the United States and then broadly across the world um, throughout the mid to later 1960s and 70s. There has been a resurgence, though, in the use and kind of an underground type culture and contexts in the recent years, though, and there's been some pharmaceutical interest in the drug as well for this prior research anti-addictive properties, given the um, widespread addiction issues that we face worldwide currently. And given numerous reports of toxicity associated with the drug, the authors of the paper wanted to essentially get a, a literature review to establish and, and examine what the current um, adverse effects are and dangerous properties associated with ibogaine. So to kind of provide to um, and, and analyze this, they did a literature review of PubMed with a focus on the pharmacologic and clinical effects of the drugs. Um, to provide a kind of a quick overview of the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, it's, an, it's essentially um, the de de derived product of the root of the shrub bark arc um, and it's taken orally um, it's absorbed and has an elimination half-life of about eight hours and also has an active metabolite uh, known as noribogaine, which is basically a demethylated version of the ibogaine uh, molecule itself. The ibogaine um, is, is a tryptamine derivative, sorry, tryptophan derivative, which is essentially kind of like the core of what makes up a lot of other um, serotonergic trans, um, drugs as well, so like serotonin and other psychedelics like, like uh, psilocybin also have this tryp um, tryptamine core that um, is at the base of the molecule. It um, is, when it's demethylated, um, the noribogaine also has pretty prolonged um, elimination half-life and is thought to contribute to some of the toxicity that's been found to occur in many patients who have used this drug. And it does cross the blood-brain barrier pretty well on both the active and um, and daughter metabolites due to its high level of felicity. The mechanism of action is multifactorial. It, it, it binds to many receptors. The main ones include NMDA, which has been um, an antagonism that receptor, just like ketamine causes some of the dissociative effects. 
it binds pretty strongly to the sigma-2 receptors um, and has decreasing affinity for the kappa and mu op opioid receptors. Um, and it also has effects, pretty strong effects, at the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, as well as the um, serotonin transporter and um, reuptake inhibitor, inhibitor effects as well. The, the norbogen metabolite um, has affinity for the serotonin receptor and kappa mu opioid receptors more than ibogaine does, and otherwise has decreased affinities for the prior mentioned receptors. It's also been found to alter gene expression of the uh, gene-derived neurotrophic growth factors, which has been found in other studies to modulate dopamine neuron survival. And it is thought that increased um, amounts of the G GDNF and increased dopamine uh, neuron um, production in the ventral tegmental area, which is important for addiction, is what maybe helps people um, overcome addiction when they use ibogaine. Though this is still pretty theoretical. Clinically, there's two main fat, um, um, systems that ibogaine affects. So clearly, it affects the central nervous system. Depending on the dose, it has a dose response curve for toxicity. In rats, it's been found to be to not have any any acute effects regarding toxicity at an acute dose of 25 mg per kg or chronically at 10 mg per kilogram, but was noted to have to induce Purkinje fiber degeneration in these rats at 100 plus milligram per kilogram dosages. In humans that have died but have taken, have died for other reasons, not from the ibogaine ingestion, but from other reasons and did have an autopsy, found that doses up to 30 milligrams per kilogram in intermittent dosing was not neurotoxic. Um, it, 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 an acute supertherapeutic ingestions can induce tremors, and this is thought to be due to the cerebellar activation and the tremors they found are not necessarily associated with neurotoxicity. And it has been found that the noribogaine, so that the, the met active metabolite is less neurotoxic than the parent drug. Current, many clinical studies have looked at dosages uh, from 500 to 800 milligrams. Um, and in some of these cases, they did find cognitive um, detrimental effects, but it was thought to be due to an ibogaine induced respiratory depression, possibly in the context of concomitant use of other opioids. And it was thought that this might be a hypoxic situation, not necessarily from the gain itself, but there's concern that these really high dosages uh, may have adverse neuro neurocognitive sequelae. The other issues are that these pay due, due to the long half-life of, of um, the, the norebogaine um, and then the differential metabolism of ibogaine itself due to the high amount of um, variability among the general population of the 2D6 um, SIP enzyme that some patients can have these persist persistent hallucinations, delusions, and manic symptoms for days to weeks after a one-time dose, especially at higher dosages. So there's concern that 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 due to the variability that people respond quite differently to the um, acute use of the drug. The other main system that's negatively affected by evil gain is a cardiovascular system. It's been found in acute ingestions to induce bradycardia with, hyper, with hypertension, which is an uncommon combination. And this is at low dosages at 10 to 25 mg per kg. Um, in African um, ceremonies, the, many of the individuals who use it for religious purposes are kept in a low stimulation environment after the use of the, of the ibogaine for days due to the um, culturally known risks of um, stim stimulation and possibly causing adverse effects. It is thought that this is that many of the cardiovascular effects that are negative in nature are due to the QTC prolongation. There's patients who have noted to have QTCs up to 616. Um, and th this though is more common at higher dosages for these really prolonged effects, but has been found to have, have some dose response as well. Um, and uh, QTC prolongation, as with many other drugs that we use um, pharmaceutically, is associated with the uh, antagonism of the HERG receptor, which is responsible for potassium recti rectification in um, neurons and cardiac myocytes. Um, although there were, uh, there's been a, a rash of multiple, of over 20 patients who've been documented die from the ibogaine ingestion, Previously, a number of them were thought to be due to underlying cardiovascular comorbidities, but when the authors did this, this study, 
they did a, a literature re a search too and found that um, in a handful of patients that, that have been more recently documented that a lot of these patients don't have any underlying cardiac issues. Um, in that, but generally they, they took pretty high dosages, two grams plus and in the acute setting. And many of these patients had QTCs that were quite prolonged and had ventricular dysrhythmias, including Trisades. Um, and overall with supportive care, most did well, but many of these cardiovascular effects took days to a week to resolve. So, it, and it's been thought that, that a lot of this is due to the persistence of the norebogain, which is, appears to be just as cardiotoxic as the parent ebogain itself. As mentioned previously, the 2D6 metabolism has been, is a concern for patients who may be taking other 2D6 uh, metabolized drugs as well. One of the common ones we think about is codeine, where depending on, on how active the polymorphism is, some patients may rapidly metabolize it and have minimal effects from um, the parent drug. So with, with ebogain, that would be, the ebogain effects would wear off pretty quick, but then you'd have pretty prolonged effects in the norebogain, whereas those who are slow metabolizers will have much, much prolonged effects from the ebogain itself and less effects from the norebogain. But due to the toxicity and the adverse effects from both parent and daughter drugs, it can be difficult to predict who's gonna have what, and that you can have these very prolonged sy syndromes where you have toxicity, especially with high doses. Um, the other issue is that due to the opioid agonism with ibogaine and noribogaine, um, patients who are taking um, it for opioid withdrawal, but may be taking opioids at the same time or other drugs that have opioid-like effects may contribute to increased risk of adverse events. Um, usually, I mean, if you're trying to get off one one of the substances, you're not going to be taking it anymore, but it does place someone at risk if they do relapse. Um, so, in conclusion, the authors found suggested that more deaths are likely given the, the toxicity and lack of clear regulation of these drugs, despite it being a Schedule One substance in the United States due to its underground availability, as well as the pharmaceutical exploration of derivatives um, in the coming years. So. Yeah, very good. This is a very interesting uh, compound. Um, it was actually researched in Harvard in like the 1990s after it was rediscovered the French version, the Labyrinth, that was used in the 30s. Uh, for a variety of reasons, the research got shut down. The researcher went offshore to the Caribbean and set up their own detox clinic, mostly for opiates, but it's since spread to a variety of other uh, substance abuse chronic things, including nicotine. Um, and those have sprouted up around the world, not inside the United States per se, but a lot of the places, including just north of us in British Columbia, there's been a couple of places, including some that have been investigated because there have been deaths inside these sort of um, camps where people go for extended detox, where they also use this substance. So we potentially could see it. We've certainly had a case or two where people have gone to Canada and bought this and have come back and continue to treat themselves uh, here uh, in the States and Oregon. Um, so something to keep our eye out for. It's yet another QTC prolonging drug, works at the Herd uh, receptor, um, but also perhaps has a little bit of neurotoxicity and, and higher doses. So that pretty much wraps up our very bad plants. There are probably a lot of other plants that aren't so very bad. And so put those ones in your your garden. We've always talked about starting a poison garden some here. We're here near the poison center, but our biggest fear is that people would pick the poisonous plants and we'd have even more uh, calls from them. So we're in a quandary about where we would possibly do that and how poisonous could the plants be if we actually planted a, a garden of them. So thank you for joining us. We're posting our toxicology podcasts um, on our website. It's also available for Apple and Soundgarden. Um, if you just search the ohsu.edu uh, page for emergency medicine, you'll eventually find a link to uh, our multiple podcasts going back 10 years. This is the first of our video podcasts. So we hope you enjoyed this new um, augmentation to our usual fare. So we will see you next time. Thank you.